Hello and welcome. Today we are going to be looking at the custom tray workflow in InLab Software 22. When you first come into the software, uh, and you'll be actually in the Splint application, it'll take you to the step known as Define Insertion Access, where we're going to obviously define the path of insertion of the tray once it's manufactured. You'll notice that two steps were technically skipped by the software, the Set Model Access and Prepare Model Phase. Really, these were already completed in the CAD software, or the CIRC software even, so it's really just a way for you to double check if you want to go back. With the form tool, you could do things like add, smooth, or remove material to the actual model itself. However, if those steps have already been completed, really the first step we want to do is define insertion axis, where we're trying to minimize undercuts. So you can see the color mapping on the actual facial aspect of this uh, particular case, and that's basically where the undercuts are present. You'll see the legend on the lower left identifies the values of those undercuts based on the path of insertion that we have currently selected with that arrow. Now typically with a custom tray we have it kind of more posteriorly and then we bring it into the anteriors for the impression. So we kind of want the insertion path to reflect the same insertion. So basically once that is defined and we move forward to the block out stage, it's automatically going to block out any undercut that I just visualized there in the previous step. So if we want to be able to actually look to see where those undercut values are, we can turn on the reline tool that will show us the color mapping below so we can see exactly what the software has um, covered for us with the blockout material. Now we at this point in time have the ability to add more blockout so with the height tool under reline we can add a thicker blockout in a more controlled manner whereas with the form tool we can add and we can set a max wax thickness so we can ensure that as we're adding material it's never going over the amount that we've set for that maximum thickness. Um, so once we're happy with the blockout which the software does a good job of blocking out what it needs to, we're able to move forward to the design step. So in the design phase, the very first thing we want to do is create the actual impression tray. So once we actually select create impression tray, we'll have the ability to also control the thickness and the lift. So the thickness referring to how thick is the material going to be for the actual tray, and the lift referring to how much space are we giving for actual impression material. So once we change those, we can define the borders. So I personally like to use create by line, where I'm double clicking with my left cursor to start and then it's a single click with my left cursor to kind of tag down that line and then I can hold my left cursor and rotate as needed. If you ever need to go back uh, a click just right click once and it will take you back one of your mouse clicks so then it'll uh, allow you to kind of refresh and, and fix up any areas that you see fit. So then as I continue on again obviously I can go over freedoms and things like that just with individual clicks which helps to curve that line and then it, it gives you obviously the ability to go around like freedoms and things like that. So when you get to the starting point, you want to double click to finish, and that will essentially define the border of your actual tray. Uh, once you have defined the borders, um, obviously when it is in the stage where it's kind of that light green with the purple edge, you can still make adjustments if you need to by double clicking on the existing line and then again double clicking to finish. Um, however, what you want to do at this point in time is you want to apply the parameters. So the applying basically the thickness and the lift at this time, because uh, otherwise it'll give you basically a flat paper thin kind of tray and it actually won't let you move forward so you always want to make sure that you hit apply at this point in time. Once you have the actual tray complete then you'll be able to now um, add several aspects in so let's say we want to add in a handle you'll have the ability to either add a front or a side handle, uh, create insertion stop which is actually a, uh, another way to say a tissue stop right so if you needed a tissue stop on your actual tray itself you have that ability and then the last option is adding implant channels so if you wanted to add for a pickup impression tray. Uh, you can add in the channels controlling the diameter and the height of the channels and making it closed or open. So when we come to add handle, it defaults to a front handle where I can control obviously the uh, parameters of the actual tray handle. So at this point I can control how long it's going to be, how wide it's going to be, and the height of it as well too. Once I'm happy, I just double click to place the actual tray, and then if I give it a click I can change the angulation of it or move it all around if I need to. So it's a, it's a way to still be able to manipulate it just by giving it one click with your left cursor so it's highlighted in that green color. Uh, so that at that point you'd still also be able to change any of the parameters for the actual you know height and width and etc. So the create insertion stop, which is also a tissue stop, um, you basically double click to start, dub, uh, double click to finish. However, if you get that error, it usually just means that you didn't 
kind of have a clean uh, connection between the starting point and the finishing point of your margin. So it just wants you to redo that. Um, so again, really minimal amount of work needed for the tissue stops. It's just a double click to start, single clicks like you do for your margins, and then double click to finish. So in the add implant channels, if this was a pickup tray, obviously it goes translucent, so you can see below to your implant sites, and then you can control if it's an open or closed tray. So in the finalized stage, a couple things we can do. So for one, if we wanted to add retention holes, you basically are able to hold down your left cursor and essentially highlight the areas that you want the holes to be considered. Okay, so basically you're able to, you know, kind of go all around and highlight that with your left. Now, if you hold your right cursor down and move your mouse up and down, you'll change the size of the actual cursor itself to make it a little bit bigger or smaller to be able to cover obviously more surface area. And then you can control things like the diameter of the holes and the distance between each each hole. So once you have that kind of determined, you can hit apply and it will apply those holes to the actual tray itself. Now, sometimes if you want to add just a couple extra single holes, a nice tool is the option to add single hole, which is considered almost like a hole punch. You can just really quickly add in an additional hole or two uh, just by double clicking. So that's what I do here. You can see that I select um, add single hole. And then I can go to maybe more of the facial area and just double click where I want to add a couple additional holes. Uh, another thing that often people will do at this point is adding a text label um, often to the handle. They'll basically place their, um, they'll double click to stick that tray handle in there. Uh, and then basically at this point we can export to manufacturing, which would be if we're connecting to our in-lab cam software for something like prime print or export to STL. Now if you are exporting to STL, just make sure that you know where you're defining the path. Uh, and this has been the custom tray workflow in InLab 22.